All right, guys. I hope you get started uh, with OpenMS. Um, before we go into more detailed workflows, um, I'm trying to inject another 30 minutes of theory uh, in your brains and, and um, give you some idea of how we actually know what we see in proteomics. What are, where do these peptides come from? So what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out if we see such a peak, um, what is really the peptide behind that? And the, the key method that we're using in proteomics um, is the database search. <laughs> um, anyhow, so we'll talk about the, the fundamental concepts of, of um, database search, and then I'll give you some details on this database search engines. But I will skim over them very briefly because we don't have the time to really go into the concept. There's more in the slides, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. But uh, I try to start with giving you an idea of how this comes about. Now, I mentioned earlier that proteomics is a post-genomic method, and that is actually what we need the genome for. Um, fundamentally, it is very hard to identify peptides just uh, based on their MS spectra. Although, in theory, it, it doesn't sound too bad. So let's look at uh, peptide identification. The goal is, is pretty straightforward. Um, we, are, we want to identify the sequence of a peptide based on its mass spectrum. In this case, that is a tandem mass spectrum. So we are doing usually collision-induced uh, dissociation. We select a precursor, a peptide, we let it collide with, say, neutral gas, and we get fragments. And that is why I showed you the, um, um, the, the overall structure of a peptide earlier, because these peptides have the property that they break preferentially at the peptide backbone. Now, when you think of, of such a peptide sequence, um, we, we can break after basically uh, every amino acid, and now, if the whole thing is charged, then this charge can be either on the left-hand side or on the right-hand side of the place where it breaks. Since we see only charged ions in the mass spectrometer, that gives rise to either what we call a, a prefix ion or a suffix ion. Yeah, so either it's the first part of the peptide that has a charge or the second part of the peptide and can break at all of these positions. So what we end up with is a range of different ions at different M over Zs. Um, these B ions uh, are the prefix ions, these Y ions are the suffix ions, we can enumerate them. Now the trick is really, when you look at uh, adjacent ions, then what is the mass difference between the ion that breaks off here and the ion that breaks off there? Well, it's just the mass of the amino acids. So if you know which peak belongs to which ion, then you can just walk this ladder of ions and basically um, determine the difference between these masses and from that get some idea of which amino acid is, it is. There's one complication. Um, there are two amino acids that have a problem with that and that's isoleucine and leucine because to mass spectrometer they are indistinguishable because they're stru just structural isomers. Uh, but let's forget about that for a minute. This is what you can do if you annotate the spectrum <coughs> manually. The key problem with that is um, nobody labels those peaks for you. So you have really no idea which peak is the Y5 and the Y4. So we have no idea at what mass differences to look. So what happens on top of that is that the spectra are incomplete. So you can get spectra like this where you see only parts of these ions. Can you still identify that? Well, you, you fundamentally cannot identify this peptide unless you have additional information on the peptide. And the idea with the database search is that we only consider sequences that should occur because we know they are part of the genome and thus the proteome. Okay. So we try to find in the database of all potential protein sequences, we find those um, sequences that would actually fit this spectrum, even though it does not contain all the information. And there might be ambiguities, and that's a bit of a problem with database search. It will always give you a result, 
and you will have to make sense of it, and that is what we will talk about in a minute. So let's see wh where these ions come from. So this here is again the, the, the peptide bond between two amino acids. So let's assume we have a peptide of length n, n amino acids, and what can happen is that um, you can either break the peptide bond here between the uh, carbon, uh, the, the keto function and the uh, amide function. Um, that gives rise to B ions, those are the prefix ions, and Y ions. That's basically everything to the right of that. But it occasionally can also break to the left of that, or to the right of that. That gives rise to A and X ions, or C, uh, C and Z ions. Um, that nomenclature has been introduced a long time ago. People knew peptides break like that. It depends on the conditions. It depends on the, on, on the way you actually do the collision, on, on, on the energy as well. Um, and then it gives um, you need series like this. This is a theoretical spectrum that you would expect when you really see all the ions. And you, you see these letters, you can basically walk this letter and determine all the sequences. Um, that is true if you see only the Y ions. Then every distance between adjacent lines is exactly the mass of one amino acid. And if you walk that, you can basically determine the sequence. The problem is um, you also have the other ions. And now I've colored them, of course, according to the ion type, but that is information you do not have in reality. You also see other things happening, like some of these uh, ions are doubly charged. Um, you don't know exactly what, what charge they have in some of these cases. Um, you see all the other ions, and you also see things like neutral losses. Neutral losses are additional fragmentation processes. Um, it's typically water or ammonia or phosphoric acid that is being lost, depending on the type of amino acids where that happens. And um, neutral loss means that whatever gets lost, uh, this neutral molecule, water or ammonia, is basically removed from the structure and what remains is still a charged ion. It's just shifted by this mass that has been lost. Um, the mechanism, the, the, the chemistry of that is, is not really straightforward in some cases, but it, it basically leads, leads to a shift of this peak. Um, these ions can also be very intense, and you will see them in the spectrum, and if you don't have an explanation, they can mislead you into interpreting these peaks in, in a way that they shouldn't be interpreted. So, while you can do that manually, and some of you have perhaps done that, really sat down with a spectrum and try to explain every single peak in it. It's a fun exercise. I can highly recommend it. Um, I doubt that many of you will make it will accept it as a hobby. It, it's just a very <laughs> tedious affair, as you can imagine. Um, it also requires uh, uh, lots of inf additional information that you only acquire over the years, really looking at the spectra and understanding the chemistry that is going on, the gas, gas phase chemistry there. So for, for most applications these days, we, we also when you have 100 million spectra, manual annotation is not the method of choice. Instead, we do this database search. And the, the underlying principle is really easy to understand. We have an experimental spectrum. And when you think about the spectrum, um, the information that is contained therein is really just a list of m over z values. Where did, uh, some issues with my mouse pointer here. OK. So you see, this is just a list of peaks. Um, also notice I, for, I did not include the intensities. It's just m over z. Which masses do you see? The second ingredient is a sequence database. OK. No flames, so that's, that's good. <laughs> the second ingredient is a database of sequences. Um, so this is basically the human proteome or a fast A file that contains, whatever, however you constructed them, all the sequences. And what we can compute or predict for each of these sequences is then a theoretical spectrum. So we pretend that we fragment this peptide at every position, and we just draw these lines accordingly. Note again, there's no intensity attached to this right now. It's just the m over z's of these peaks. <laughs> 
and let's assume we have like three different peptides that can come from there. So we have these uh, M over Z, these peak lists. And now what we do is we compare all of these theoretical spectra to this experimental spectra and we need some simil similarity measure. We need to determine which of these theoretical spectra is closest to the experimental spectrum. So what our search engine gives us at some point is these are the, let's say in this case, three, three sequences that we found in the sequence database that are potential candidates for that. And these are the scores. And if you com compute these scores properly, then you should expect that the highest ranking guy is probably the closest match. So two things you should notice here is uh, the highest scoring guy um, is not necessarily the right one. Um, you will always find a random match that has some score, some non-zero score. So database search is always going to tell you something. That is not necessarily the right answer. The other thing to notice is that you can only find stuff that you actually have in your sequence database. So it's not going to give you new things. And, and, and we know that, for example, in, in, in the human genome, we have plenty of genomic variants. So if your patient or subject from which the, the, the um, proteome came had different single nucleotide polymorphisms in, in, in one of those positions, and you didn't sequence that particular patient, then you will not be able to find these peptides. So there are quite a few caveats. Yeah? We're really restricting the search space. That makes it easy. But we lose some information. And we really need to make sure that this scoring here works well. And we need to get some idea of which of these scores to trust. And that's sort of the magic in this search engine. Um, it's not totally obvious how you do that. Um, fundamentally, it's it's a number of it's five key steps. The first step is really extract all sequence candidates. So you go over your database and you ask the question: Which of these could, in theory, give rise to a peptide of mass? 1014 Dalton or whatever your mass is. That is a precursor ion mass. Uh, you basically determine what did I fragment. And not all of these sequences will match. And this is where it is essential that we did a triptych digest. You remember shotgun? We did shotgun proteomics. So we did not create all possible subsequences of our proteins, but only triptych peptides. And that re reduces the search space drastically. We only look at triptych peptides, and they have to have the right mass to match a particular spectrum. For each of these candidate sequences, and, and that's not millions, that is then hundreds um, that are depending on the mass tolerance, of course, if then also on the database size. Uh, it can be many, it can be, can be fewer. You can imagine if you have just a bacterial genome, then you have fewer candidates than with a plant genome, so there are many considerations there. But usually it's a limited number of candidates, and for each of those you generate a theoretical spectra. You then align and score the, spect the theoretical spectra to the experimental spectrum, and finally you report all these peptide spectrum matches. And you will find that in literature people abbreviate that as PSMs, peptide spectrum match. And it, it's, it, it's not really an identification. A peptide spectrum match is just that one of these spectra matches a theoretical sequence, and you have a score for that. And at some point, we need to separate these PSMs from what we would consider reliable identification. Uh, but that is something we'll talk about after the coffee break. So how do we generate the, the, the candidates? Um, if we are given an experimental spectrum, uh, we just um, look at the search space as for any given mass tolerance D. So we have to know how accurately can we actually measure these masses. And once we know that, we just go over our database, we extract all the peptide sequences, and we check whether the candidate mass of, of that particular triptych sequence is within the error tolerance of the precursor for that experimental spectrum. And all of those are kept, and they define the search spectrum for this particular experimental spectrum. Um, then we generate a theoretical spectrum. Um, how can you do that? How do you generate a theoretical spectrum? 
for a given peptide sequence. Yeah, we have a peptide sequence, a candidate sequence. We want to generate the theoretical spectrum. Well, you need to mix. Yeah. It's really straightforward. You just walk the sequence and, and you decide that you want to simulate a specific ion series. So say B and Y ions in the simplest case, um, but also neutral losses. And you basically look at every amino acid and you cut after this amino acid and you presume what would be the mass that I expect for the B and for the Y ion in this case. And then you just put them all together, throw them in one, to one pot and, and that is your spectrum. Uh, so it's reasonably straightforward the way it is implemented. Um, if you have then several of these spectra, you need to align them. You need to have some idea of when two peaks actually are the same. Um, there are different ways to score that. Not all of them require alignment, but it's, it's typically done. The idea is if the theoretical spectrum and the experimental spectrum are the same thing, then, then, then they should share many of those peaks. Not all of them, those peaks, because there are also noise peaks, there are additional fragmentations that are not contained in your theoretical spectrum. And you need to deal with that. And you can also imagine if you fragment a peptide that has a similar sequence, that you will also have shared peaks even though they are two different things. Okay, because they would start with the same five amino acids, then the peaks that come from these first five amino acids would be identical. So that's why um, you need to have some way of scoring how well that agrees with, uh, and, and, and we need to normalize for spectra, but we will get back to that in a minute. So there are many different tools for comparing theoretical and experimental spectra. The main difference between different search engines is really how they handle um, these scoring schemes that are implemented, and, and that also implies differences in runtime, difference in, in, in the magnitude of these scores, how these scores need to be interpreted. Um, but conceptually, these the, the search engines are all the same. They really do these four steps, and, and there are various minor variations like refinements and discarding certain peaks, filtering these peaks. Um, there, there's lots of magic going on that's also not really contained in some of these papers. Um, so you be, need to be careful, but once you understand that a spectrum goes in, the database goes in, and you get, get a bunch of scores, you can start to understand how to interpret it. Oftentimes, the workflows that are in the search engines, I just picked one, are a bit more complex than just the core steps that I, that I mentioned. So you can uh, process the database uh, first. You can look at possible modifications that are contained there, and I'll get back to that in a minute. You can also have missed cleavages. That means non-peptides um, uh, that are not triptych, yeah, because one of these sites actually was skipped. Um, you can have um, contaminants. Um, these are spectra that you would expect to not be stemming from your sample, keratin, for example, that you would like to remove in the identification. Um, and eventually, you will also have to compute something like a statistical significance, and then you have to report the whole thing. And that is what these search engines do for you in, in one go. So we will do a very quick flyover for some of these search engines. Um, as I said, you can read up. The, uh, yes, please. Because the M over Z is really determined by the composition of this fragment ion. And, you know, a carbon is a carbon is a carbon. And it always way to say, have the same mass uh, independent of the, of, the, of the machine that you acquire it on. What can happen, though, is the fragmentation is slightly different and the relative intensities. So depending on how you fragment, you end up with different ions and you end up with ions that are higher on this machine and lower on the other. So that is also, these intensities are pretty variable, and that is why many of these search engines do not really consider the, the, the variance. Um, it is much easier to reproduce the, the mass than it is to reproduce the intensity. Okay, um, there are literally dozens of different databases, probably a hundred, probably more. <laughs> not really. Has anybody counted them? I don't think so. Um, there are different tools 
the difference between these tools with respect to spectrum pre-processing, how to do the scoring, how to do post-processing, filtering of these matches, how to do the score statistics, and of course with respect to speed, but also with respect to licenses. Some of them are commercial, others are free. For some of them you have to pay, for others you don't. Um, and ultimately, um, these search engines give you very similar results. There's no real big difference. There's not one search engine that, that is sort of always superior to others. Um, you can forget about that. Uh, and you never really know which search engine works well on which data set. Um, Xtandem is a pretty popular open source database search engine that is also very fast. Um, it has been published in various versions, uh, including refinements. Um, there are many different papers that describe some of the details. Um, ultimately, uh, what it does is uh, similar to what I just described on a generic level. Um, it looks at overlapping masses. It basically tries to uh, compare these spectra by figuring out which peak in the theoretical spectrum aligns to which peak in the uh, experimental spectrum and depending on, on, on the instrument it uses different um, search thresholds. If you have low resolution spectra you often have 0.5 Dalton for high risk spectra you can narrow it down a bit and that changes the score and the scoring function it uses once it has aligned these peaks. You know, see these, these uh, red peaks up here have an equivalent here in the theoretical spectrum. So these ions could basically be identified in this experimental spectrum. And then it computes uh, a, a dot product score. A uh, dot product between two vectors, that's basically where it comes from. You just multiply the intensity um, of the experimental spectrum with the predicted or theoretical spectrum. Since the theoretical spectra have zero or one as intensities, you basically multiply the theoretical spectrum and sum up the intensities of the peaks that have been identified in the theoretical spectrum. Um, this simple score, uh, people have, have tried many very sophisticated scores. Um, you can spend years of your life on, on improving these scores, but in the end it's usually the simple things that work really well and it's the same here in scoring spectra. Um, once you get the score and, and you know this score says like 517, um, what does that really tell you? And the answer is probably not a lot. It depends on, on the length of the peptide. You can imagine if you have more peaks, um, you can get higher scores. Um, it depends on your database. If you have a very large database, then getting random hits is a lot easier than in a small database. So there are many factors that go in. So people started doing statistics um, by looking at not just one PSM, but looking at everything in one run or everything in one large data set. So once you start doing statistics, it becomes easier to distinguish what are identifications that occur by random and what are identifications that are reliable. And you can start thinking uh, about this by, by, by looking at score distribution. Uh, this year are not scores, but this is just a you basically construct a, a histogram. A histogram, in histogram you have a random variable and you have the frequency and you bin that in a way. You basically count how often do I see a certain value of that. Why is that interesting for the identification? Well, you can look at how often on a larger data set have I, did I see a score of x. Uh, just by counting them. F of x, that's the frequency of x. You divide that by the number of your PSMs that you have overall, and that gives you some probability P of x for seeing this score. Now, the idea is that all these random matches will give, on average, lower scores, yeah, because they are just randomly occurring spread out over the spectrum. So you would expect the true identifications to have higher scores. Now, when you look at these distributions, you will see all these false identifications as well. And we will talk later on on how to do that in st statistically meaningful manner. Um, but the idea would then be, um, you ask the question, what's the probability that the score that I observe is, is, is higher than any other score? And, and you look at this background distribution that if you have a score that is reasonably far away from these random scores, then you would tend to trust it. And people over time have worked out like thresholds. Uh, there's one group uh, 
when I talk to them, they believe only scores that are greater than 30 or 40. Um, because over the years they have figured out where are these thresholds in, in, in their setting and their samples. But we can do a lot better than that, um, and, and we will discuss that in the lecture uh, later on after the coffee break, where we will be talking about false discovery rates. That's basically the concept behind that. But it all goes back to this type of score and looking at the distribution of these scores. Um, X tandem computes a source score, a so called hyperscore as well. Um, this hyperscore uh, can be applied in the same way. You have basically background matches, and if your PSM is far removed from this, then you have a trustworthy hit. And there are many different ways on how to interpret that. You can also look at the second best hit. Why would you hope to have a second best hit that is far away from, from your proper hit? Well, if there is a gap between the two, then you can be sure that this one identification that you have is reasonably unique. But if, if your best hit is already here and the second best hit is there, then it's quite likely that they come from the same uh, distribution of incorrect identifications. So that is something that people look at. Um, you can also transform that. Um, you can turn this distribution into an estimated likelihood and an e-value representation. And um, what you can do is you look at this distribution of incorrect hits, and we will see how, later how we generate in incorrect hits. Um, there's, a, there's a trick to that. And you can ask the question, how far is my best hit away from that? Well, you can fit that. In, in, in this particular plot, you can say, well, the hyperscore degrades like this, and, and, and if your best hit is here, you can sort of extrapolate um, what, how many matches you would expect on random on this data set that you were looking at. And that gives you some idea of how to interpret and how to trust this score. Um, it is not yet uh, a confidence estimate at this point, uh, but it's uh, some measure of how trustworthy is the score. And this trick in, in various variations can, be, can fundamentally be applied to all search engines. Uh, you need different transformations. The meaning of these scores are different. Uh, with Sequest, for example, another search engine that you might have heard of, they have different scores. Um, they also consider um, uh, they have a way of, of, of uh, shifting the spectra to generate random matches, and that gives you some idea of what you would expect by, for incorrect matches. You get a different distribution of these scores, um, and in this way you can compute yet another score. So what are the search engines that we would like to look at? Well, most of you have probably worked with uh, Mascot, or have seen Mascot from Metric Science, so that's the most popular uh, commercial search engine, I would argue. Um, there's also Phoenix, there's Inspect, there's Mirimatch. I think OpenMS at the moment supports, what is it, eight, nine different search engines. Um, so it's kind of convenient to replace these search engines, and that's one of the advantages of OpenMS, because what we did, we did wrappers around these search engines. And, and then plugging and unplugging one of these search engines does no longer require tinkering with input out formats, output formats, but you can just drag and drop the nodes. You will see that in the... Uh, in the hands-on session. Each of these search engines then has um, distinct settings and I would like to point out a few things that are essential when you're dealing with uh, database search engines. Um, there, there are different types of modifications that you would need to consider and we usually have fixed modifications and, and variable modifications. Um, where does this carbamidomethylation come from? Periodization. Yeah. More, what of what? Periodization of the cysteines. Yeah, the cysteines you want to alkylate, yeah. and uh, that's uh, this carbamidomethylation. Um, some of these amino acids can also oxidize, so we have oxidation of methionine in particular, that can happen just from the sample standing around and, and oxygen in the air. Um, and you want to include that because any sequence modification that you do not include in the search engine, you will not be able to identify these peptides. 
And if you don't have this fixed modification, this carbon, um, a carbon middle methylation in there, you will not be able to identify a single peptide that contains a cysteine. Uh, just something to keep in mind. Um, we do things to these peptides in the sample processing that are often not really talked about. Uh, if you see, read the methods section carefully, you will find it, of course. Um, but there are some details to see these search engines that are not talked about a lot. You, we can also discuss the cleavage sites. If you go from trips into a different enzyme, then we need to have different cutting sites where we actually cleave the proteins. Uh, and then you have instrument-dependent parameters like what is a precursor mass tolerance uh, and what is a fragment mass tolerance. A precursor mass tolerance, that's basically the accuracy of the initial MS spectrum. And then you have the fragment mass tolerance that tells you how accurate are the masses in the tandem spectrum. Yes, actually it hurts a lot. Okay. Um, any ideas why that is? What can? It's always going to look for it. Yeah, so it will always, uh, performance will be worse. Yeah. Because when you think about it, what does it need to do when it considers variable modifications? It, it just constructs all the theoretical spectra and it enumerates them. So if you have many var variable modifications, you run into some sort of combinatorial explosion. Yeah? Because if you have four variable modifications that can be there or not, then it has to uh, assume, well, I have one case where neither of these variants is there, then one is there, two not there, so you have to enumerate all combinations. Now, if you have two of them, if you have four variable modifications, that gives two to the power of four, different candidates. So your space that you search explodes by a factor of 16. And your false discovery rate should increase. Exactly. Yeah. And then also the odds of finding something by random goes through the roof. So suddenly your, your search times are uh, an order of magnitude higher and also the number of potential false identifications explode. That's why you need to be very careful with variable modifications. Well, that depends on you. You have to download it. So if you update it regularly. Well, that depends a bit on what database we're talking, um, because there are different sources for these databases. Um, fundamentally, um, um, they are released on a regular basis. But by now, when we're talking about model organisms, they are reasonably well converged. And if you update them once per year, then you're probably on the same side. But that, again, depends a bit on what you're working with. If you're working with uh, non-model organisms uh, where you have just a rough genome draft in there, um, then this genome draft can change a lot within a couple of months, and then, then you should update more, more of them. All right, I need to uh, speed up a, bit, a little bit. Um, here we're talking, uh, we just talked about that. This is just carbon beta methylation with the iodoacetamide that gives you fixed variant, um, but you can also have these variable uh, modifications like uh, this uh, methionine uh, oxidation that goes from a sulfoxide to the sulfone. Um, the problem is um, as you try to identify spectra, and that is something that baffles people once they see that for the first time. This is an experiment where we have different numbers of variable modifications. And this here is the number of identified spectra in the same data set. So naively, you would think, if I allow all these modifications, I can find more stuff in my data set. But in reality, the number of identified peptides go, goes down. And it goes down quite a bit. Why? Yeah. The reason is that these variable modifications are still rare. So 
the increase that you can get out of actually identifying these modified peptides doesn't grow as quickly as the search space. Uh, the search space grows a lot quicker and the ratio between the two is what decides whether you can identify something or not. So you see that you actually dilute what you can identify. You dilute it down um, by including these variable modifications. And of course your search time goes through the roof if you do this experiment. You can wait for days and days for this to terminate if you go to 10 variable modifications. Can you estimate how much of the patch is going to be one Yeah, you can. You can do that, yeah. But it basically, it, it's a word of caution. Yeah? It seems obvious that you should include everything so that, that you don't miss anything. But in reality, if you include everything, if you're not sure that you're looking for a specific modification, you should not include it. But it, it's evident that if you want to do phosphoproteomics, you need to include phosphorylation as a variable modification, or you, you will not find anything. But you should be really sure that you need this, var this variable modification. All right, that's all I have to say for now. <laughs>